Good evening, I'm Ian Hanneman Singh. Tonight, the final sprint toward Election Day has begun and the gloves are off. The leader's last push to get your vote and the fallout over last night's debate. A powerful storm roars into Newfoundland. You get a couple of million dollars worth of votes standing in water and you worry to death and it's your livelihood. What to expect from Larry and when the worst will hit. A Canadian tennis star preps for the biggest match of her career. Tomorrow's high hopes and the fans cheering her on. Plus, 20 years ago tomorrow, thousands of travelers were diverted to Gander. The world became so small, really, really quick. And I think that's what sticks with me today. What 9-11 means to the community now. This is The National. We expected that our first federal election during a pandemic would be unusual. At times, it was quiet, sometimes ugly. But now, as usual, the last few days will bring a sense of urgency. There are 10 days left in the campaign. Last night's English language debate was the only one on the schedule. And now, with every event, every interview, the stakes get higher. As Travis Danran shows us, as opportunities to make an impression with voters run out, the campaigns are ramping up. We're all in this together. A rare show of unity, all five leaders coming together to encourage Canadians to get vaccinated. Get the shot. But now the gloves are off in the final fight to the finish. The leaders racing through a dizzying schedule of battleground ridings. Erin O'Toole targeting liberal held ridings in the greater Toronto area today. What I will commit to is being a partner to Mayor Crombie and Mississauga. The GTA is an incredible part of our national economy. Justin Trudeau was also in that region hoping to pick up votes. Ontario, Quebec, NBC, all key provinces for the leaders to target in the coming days. All of this after a big debate last night that was expected to be a game changer. You may repeat as many times as you want that those are discriminatory laws. Part of the conversation today after concerns about the questions and claims the format was limiting. I think, you know, there's a lot of people commenting on uh, the ease of uh, interjecting during this uh, that's last night's debate or not. Um, the moderator was herself interrupting Monsieur Blanchet while he was uh, delivering the answer. I didn't think that adding my voice uh, was right. It really limited the ability of the leaders to sort of debate each other and to really be able to give a, a little bit more time to be able to flesh out some of their ideas and to give Canadians, I think, some more um, specific information that they're looking for on various policies and initiatives. Two of the party leaders cast advance ballots today, joining other Canadians making up their minds. All right, here goes. Underscoring time is running out before September 20th. Travis, it's a group of media organizations, including the CBC, responsible for organizing the debate. So how has the, the consortium responded to the criticisms? Well, good evening to you, Ian. Well, the debate broadcast group, they got back to me tonight, and they are explaining how they came up with last night's format. It says after reviewing over 20,000 responses from Canadians right across the country, a team of journalists from CBC, APTN, CTV News, and Global News decided on the most important issues and then decided on those five themes for last night. The group maintains the format allowed for a fair and balanced debate on ballot box issues, but added it will be evaluating and reviewing all aspects of the debate to see how improvements can be made for future elections, Ian. All right, Travis, thanks. Some of the complaints about last night's debate were focused on one question directed to bloc leader Yves-Francois Blanchet. You deny that Quebec has problems with racism, yet you defend legislation such as Bills 96 and 21, which marginalize religious minorities, Anglophones and allophones. Those bills ban some civil servants from displaying religious symbols and make French the only language required to work in the province. Please help them understand why your party also supports these discriminatory laws. The question seems to imply the answer you want. From Quebec's premier today, outrage. That was an attack for sure against Quebec. Come on, it's unacceptable. And he wasn't alone. As a Quebecer, I found that question really offensive. 
Quebecers are not racist, and it's unfair to, to make that sweeping categorization. The media group that organized the debate stresses the question did not state that Quebecers were racist, but analysts say the way it was asked could boost the bloc's profile in Quebec. The whole thing is very helpful for Mr. Blanchet. It was a huge gift to him. Police in Ontario have arrested and charged a man accused of threatening the Liberal leader Justin Trudeau. It happened during this rally in Cambridge last week. Trudeau was met by angry protesters hurling obscenities and death threats. The 32-year-old from Kitchener is due in court later this month. And we want to let you know about something special that we're doing starting on Sunday, face-to-face -face with the leaders of four national parties with seats in the House of Commons. Your stance on the pipeline is a hard no. Mm -hmm. A hard no shows me that you're turning your back on those Canadians. That's what it feels like. What is your government going to do when the next country, after Brexit talks or whatever, come in and ask for more market access? The leaders going one-on-one -on -one with voters answering your questions face-to-face. -face. I just want to ask you what you're going to do to help us. Last year... Oh, where is the money coming from? Well, Sorry to cut you no, off. No, no, no. Moderated by our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, Sunday through Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern on CBC News Network and right here on The National. To eastern Newfoundland now, where Hurricane Larry is bearing down on the island's east coast. Wind gusts of up to 140 kilometers an hour are expected overnight, along with a dangerous storm surge that may lead to coastal flooding. Chris O'Neill Yates caught up with some residents preparing for what could be the region's worst storm in more than a decade. In a place that's no stranger to wind and waves, it takes an extreme weather forecast for owners to haul their boats on shore. But Jimmy Williams doesn't want to gamble on Hurricane Larry's ferocity. I'm up to uh, keep my boat from getting smashing up in the storm. I figured the safest place to have her is on land. This bay, like many in the trajectory of Larry, is open to the high winds and waves that will lash this coastline. You're going to get seas in the bay that's probably seven, eight feet high. Con O'Brien works with a tour boat company. They already moved the larger vessels to a more sheltered location. This is the last one out, just in time before Larry strikes. You get a couple of million dollars worth of boats standing in the water and you're worried to death and it's your livelihood. And... Harbour Master Sharon Locke is doing the rounds. These are the offloading uh, docks here where the boats come in. Locke is switching off power to the cranes that offload crab and shrimp catches. What could happen sure if you didn't turn it off? Uh, well, the doors, uh, of course, the doors could blow open here, and of course, anything with electricity powered on, it was still powered on, I mean, could catch fire or anything could happen here, right? Around St. John's, trees and power lines are often dangerously intertwined. That's a concern for the power company, with Larry bearing down. Stay in your home, and especially tomorrow is going to be a lot of debris, limbs, the wires down across the road, so stay in and give the crews uh, a, a chance to clear the roads at least. Back in Bay Bulls, even though their boats are safe on shore, it will be a sleepless night for these guys. I'll be down here at 2 o'clock tomorrow morning watching the wind. Still be here watching because we're looking forward to, I guess, seeing what it's going to do, but we won't be as worried now, so that's, that's, uh, that's the main thing. They've done their best to keep their boats safe, hoping Larry won't do its worst. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Bay Bulls, Newfoundland. Well, things sure are different now in St. John's. It's already Saturday morning, and meteorologist Ashley Brawweiler joins us. And uh, describe what you're in the middle of right now, Ashley. Well, the winds are whipping. It is pouring rain. In fact, I just heard uh, there's some scaffolding down the street. I'm outside my house uh, in St. John's. There's some scaffolding down the street that just fell. Uh, and I'm really worried about that heading across the street. You can see these gusts. In fact, I even have to hold on to the door frame at some point. It almost knocked me over earlier. And we're expecting these winds to continue for most of the night tonight. We're looking at gusts upwards of 120, even 140 kilometers per hour. We may even see some gusts in excess woo, of 150 kilometers per hour, Ian. And, and, you know, I, I did say if you don't feel safe, definitely get out of there. and We won't keep you there for very long. Uh, tell me a little bit more about what Newfoundland is expecting. Yeah, so as we 
uh, head through the overnight hours. We're looking at those winds gusting. Uh, the rainfall right now, uh, somewhere between 20 to 40 millimeters of rain, but it's falling very quickly, and we're going to expect that to get uh, to end as we head into the early morning hours, even looking at some sunshine by the time we get into uh, daybreak. All right, Ashley, nice job. And, of course, we hope you get inside where it's dry and safe uh, right away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ian. Let's turn now to COVID. It is surging in Saskatchewan, but the province isn't imposing any new restrictions. There were 432 new cases today. That is just short of the record of 443, which was set last Friday. Health officials are predicting both of those figures will soon be eclipsed by counts in the 500s. And those same officials have urged the Premier, Scott Moe, to bring back mask mandates. He didn't, and that disappoints some people who have first-hand experience with the damage COVID does. Bonnie Allen has more. Laurel Schaefer has been heavily medicated ever since she contracted COVID-19 nine months ago. I was considered recovered within 14 days, and let me tell you, I'm far from recovered. The 35-year-old mother of two used to be healthy and active, but now she suffers brain fog, migraines, and deep fatigue. I'll be so thirsty, but I can't roll over in bed to even grab my water bottle because that takes too much. Um, I can't in those moments stand any sort of light or noise, so I can't have my children even in the same room as me. As cases surge, Schaefer is speaking out, upset by the lack of restrictions in Saskatchewan. It's just incompetent and really um, negligent. Today, Premier Scott Moe reinstated a public health order that requires COVID-19 positive people to self-isolate. That hasn't been the case since July 11th. The province is also reducing elective health services to ease pressure on the system. But no indoor masking mandate, no province-wide vaccine requirements for events or public facilities. And I know some of you may be here wondering why I'm not imposing, you know, broad restrictions and mandates here today. And I've said before, restrictions are a stopgap measure. They were always intended to be temporary and they were to get us to a point where vaccines are largely available and accessible and they are today. We're doing the worst and this Premier is choosing to do the least in response. Nurses are feeling demoralized, defeated, depressed, burnt out. There needs to be some relief in the system. Schaefer is worried about her children, still too young to get the vaccine. I do not want any child, let alone my child, to end up like me. She's warning other healthy people to wear masks and get vaccinated, even if the government isn't forcing you to. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. And vaccinations could soon be available for younger kids as well. Pfizer's partner BioNTech has told German media it's set to ask for approval for vaccination of children as young as five. Officials in the United States have told Reuters they expect to give that approval by the end of October. Canada's National Advisory Panel on Vaccines is now recommending a third shot for some Canadians who are immunocompromised. As for the rest of the population, the committee says it's looking at the data, but still too early to recommend a third shot. A woman in Kamloops, British Columbia, believes her mother died in part because the local emergency room was short-staffed. And while officials haven't revealed the details of the case, a doctor says the ER has lost 25% of its nurses. Brady Strachan has the story. Oh, they say money talks, but all mine says is bye. Bonnie Hall remembers her mom Susan as a fun-loving and gentle woman. Susan Tasson was in good health, but on Tuesday, she started complaining about stomach pain. And so Bonnie took her to the emergency room at Royal Inland Hospital. You know, what a place to, what a place to die. Um, devastating. Hall says the emergency ward was full of patients with only a few nurses on staff. She says they sat in the waiting area for six hours as her mother's pain increased. And I know there were a couple of times where mom, my mom said to me, you know, should we just go? And I said, you know, oddly, eerily enough, I said, you know, maybe we could go, but if something happens, God forbid something happens, that you, we are here and there's, they can do something if something does. But then Hall discovered her mother had suddenly died in the waiting room. The exact details of what happened remain unclear as health officials have declined to comment due to privacy issues. 
Royal Inland Hospital is facing a staffing crisis as it deals with an increasing number of COVID patients during this fourth wave. A Kamloops doctor says the emergency ward has lost 20 of its 80 nurses because of the stressful working conditions, with another 20 shifting to casual work. This is the worst I've ever seen it. And um, it's the demoralization of the staff that I think is the most frustrating. Uh, we're losing really, really good nurses. BC's health minister says there will be a full and comprehensive review of Tashin's patient care at the hospital by the health authority and the patient care quality review board. As for Bonnie Hall, she says her mother's case should serve as a wake-up call. She's calling on the province for a major reform of the health care system. This kind of thing needs to not happen again. And that's the most powerful thing I think my mother would have wanted from all of this is, you know, can we, can we fix it? Brady Strack and CBC News, Kamloops, British Columbia. Well, let's shift now to the Canadian economy where 90,000 jobs were added last month, marking the third straight month of gains. But as Jacqueline Hansen shows us, the labour market certainly hasn't made a full pandemic recovery yet. Snow on these ski hills is still months away, but a hiring blitz at Blue Mountain Resort is already underway. We start our ramp up today. To bring the full operation to life requires 1,200 new hires. Finding all of them could be a challenge. This summer, the resort could only get 80% of the workers it needed, so some services were scaled back. I think there is a little bit of fear that working in, in hospitality, especially in forward-facing service positions, that they might not be the best choice for somebody at this point. Most of the jobs added in Canada in August were in the services sector, but employment in hotels and restaurants is still below pre-pandemic levels. And Canada's economy overall has 156,000 fewer jobs than it did in February 2020. There are a lot of job openings, but uh, it doesn't seem that uh, the, the labour supply is there. Reports of businesses struggling to rehire is something the head of the Bank of Canada said yesterday his team is trying to understand. Analyst theories range from workers switching industries to reduced immigration or laid off workers relying on government aid instead. You would think at some point it would start pressuring wages so businesses may have to increase uh, what they're paying uh, new staff in order to attract uh, workers and that's something we haven't seen yet. But that pressure on businesses could be coming. And as cases of COVID-19 climb again, they also face more potential economic uncertainty. We'll really have to get past the Delta shock for, the, for employment to continue strengthening. At Blue Mountain, full employment is key to the resort's recovery. We have the people that want to visit the destination. We need the staff and key to the recovery of Canada's entire economy. Though getting there may still be an uphill climb. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. For Canadian tennis fans, this has been an incredible week and it isn't over yet. After cutting a path through top seeded rivals, tomorrow Leila Fernandez competes in the U.S. Open Finals. Paul Hunter is at Flushing Meadows where the 19-year-old Montrealer is already a sensation. There she is today on the practice court, cool as ever, just doing her thing. Canada's Leila Fernandez getting set for tomorrow's women's singles final at the U.S. Open. Can you believe it? Those who came today to watch her sure can. When she beat Osaka, I guess this, this girl has a big chance. Not least, Filipino-American Edward Gaddy. For him, the story of Fernandez with her Ecuadorian dad and her Filipino-Canadian mom has inspired his whole family. And you bet they watched her semi-final win last night. It's just unbelievable. I'm j jumping all over the place. I, I, I watched it on TV last night with my wife and my kids, and we're all yeah, jumping. That semi-final thriller underlined another reason so many have fallen for Fernandez. The sheer joy she seems to exude. On the grounds of the Open today, with tickets for tomorrow's final in hand, Jeff and Jolene Funky, who flew in from Vancouver, underlined they love her positive energy. She's truly Canadian, really. <laughs> this is really what it is to me. Like, she's just here for the fun. She's here to entertain the crowd. 
and uh, yeah, it's just she's just a lot of fun to watch. And to win a Grand Slam tennis <laughs> tournament. That as well, yeah. There is, of course, an obstacle in the path of Fernandez, Britain's Emma Raducanu, born in Toronto, like Fernandez, an upstart teen now on one of the biggest stages in tennis. They'll face each other for the championship tomorrow. A third Canadian-born player, Felix Auger Aliasim, today fell just short of the final, losing in the men's semis. What a week for Canadian tennis, and especially Fernandez. These Montrealers will be in the stands tomorrow and have a message for her from Quebecers back home. I would say just enjoy the moment, have fun and uh, be proud because we are proud of what you're doing right now. So, Paul, usually you have sage political analysis, but let's talk tennis. What, what's your sense of the kind of match we'll, we'll see tomorrow? Um, a good one, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Um, look, these two have uh, these two have played each other before, Ian, a number of times uh, on the junior circuit. So they know, you know, they know how each other behaves on a tennis court. Um, but look, this ain't the junior circuit. Tomorrow, each of these players is going to be under more pressure than they've ever faced in their entire lives playing tennis. The winner will almost certainly be the one who best deals with that pressure. And it's worth noting that throughout this tournament, Fernandez has been adept at dealing with pressure. So, we'll see. All right. Fun assignment, Paul. Thank you. With the 20th anniversary of 9-11 tomorrow, many are thinking back to that terrible day, and some are still living with the consequences. 9-11 didn't end on 9-11. Every single day, more and more people in the 9-11 community are dying from their cancer. Up next, the health effects that continue for some. And later, the small town 9-11 story that captured the imagination of the world. The principal came on the intercom telling students to bring their books home. That's when we were told we had to turn the school into a hotel. We go back to Gander, Newfoundland, and the week that changed lives forever. Plus, the success of Layla Fernandez has a Nova Scotia woman thinking about her own time on the court. Well, I just loved it. I just went on playing as long as I could. At 104 years old, she's doing what she can for the next generation of Canadian tennis stars. We're back in two. Ten more Canadians boarded a flight out of Afghanistan today, the second one organized by the government of Qatar. The first flight on Thursday carried 43 Canadians. This was the first large-scale departure the Taliban has allowed since U.S. troops left last week. Tomorrow marks 20 years since the World Trade Center in New York City was attacked. Beyond the terrible toll that day is the health impact from the toxic debris and dust. As Chris Reyes shows us, it's more than first responders who are suffering. The classroom that I was in when the first tower fell. Dana Nelson was only 14 years old on 9-11. Her school just blocks away from ground zero. 20 years later, she still finds it hard to talk about that day. It was one of the most traumatic things I've ever been through. But last December, something happened that broke her silence. She was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. I really want people to know that you didn't have to be on the pile. You didn't have to be digging through rubble for this to be something that's impacting your health. The government-funded program now helps Nelson pay for her cancer treatment. Lawyer Michael Barish represents Nelson and many others like her. He calls them the forgotten victims of 9-11. Hundreds of thousands of civilians, students, office workers, residents, who went back to the area when they were told the air was safe. 9-11 didn't end on 9-11. Every single day, more and more people in the 9-11 community are dying from their cancers. After more than a decade of advocacy and medical research following 9-11, the U.S. government now recognizes the link between at least 70 kinds of cancers, as well as other illnesses, and exposure to 9-11 toxins. That link drove lawmakers to fund the World Trade Center Health Program and the Victim Compensation Fund for another 70 years. The government let us down and then they did the right thing. So it's just heartbreaking to know how many people haven't taken advantage of it. Less than 10% of the non-responders know about this. Since I got sick at such a young age, I've felt 
so strongly about making sure that anyone who was down here or spent time down here in the aftermath of September 11th gets screened. And Nelson is determined to spread that awareness, even if it means doing something she dreads, revisiting an event that 20 years later continues to haunt her reality. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. As we look back at the events of 9-11, we're also remembering the big contribution of a small town in Newfoundland. The world became so small really, really quick. And I think that's what sticks with me today. Up next, the Gander School that opened its arms to the world. Plus. Yeah, it's, it's really convenient. It's really safe. Everybody's far apart, so I really like it. How pandemic restrictions could change where you cast your vote. Welcome to the land where we lost our loved ones and we said we will still go on. Welcome to the land where the winds tried to blow and we said no. Hundred people. So good. The cast of the hit musical Come From Away performing a free show on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington this evening. This is the first time they've performed live since the pandemic shut the musical down in March of last year. Of course, that story is based on an intense experience when the town of Gander, Newfoundland took in thousands of diverted passengers. A story that the CBC's Kayla Hounsel knows well because she was there along with so many other students whose school suddenly became a refuge. Tonight, she's back in Gander, bringing us the story of how that week changed the lives of so many young people. How are you? <laughs> didn't you graduate? A few years ago. Okay, I thought that. Okay, I was going to have to <laughs> But didn't you life. retire? I did too. Yeah. Okay, should we go and look inside? Let's go. In. Let's go see what This yeah. is a real trip down memory lane. It is. <laughs> Meet Mr. Well, Mosher. He says I, I should call him Brian now. After all, it's been 20 years since he was my teacher, but he'll always be Mr. Mosher to me. You know how you tell how old you are in a high school? How? By how far down the hallway you are. Right. See, the pictures start back there. This is not good. I don't know about this. And you are, like, right before the next quarter. This is Gander Collegiate, GC as we call it here. Gander's only high school, home of the Concords, and on September 11th, 2001, home to 357 stranded passengers. You might know Gander's story. Aviation history, 38 planes forced to land as U.S. airspace closed, a tremendous community response, a hit Broadway musical. That moment rings through these halls, etched in the memories of the people, students and teachers. Uh, this is your first year in an advanced math course. I was in this same advanced math course on 9-11 when an announcement was made. The principal came on the intercom telling students to bring their books home, any medications or whatever, whatever they need for the next few days. That's when we were told we had to turn the school into a hotel. You might have heard of Brian Mosier. The reporter character Janice Mosier in the musical Come From Away is partially modeled after him. Tom Brokaw phones me. Tom Brokaw. He's doing a documentary, and since I was the only reporter in town, I'm the only one with any footage. So. Tom Broca. <laughs> Tom Broca. But Mosier also wrote a media course and successfully petitioned the federal government for funding to create a TV studio in our high school. He spent a lot of time there. He wanted his students to get real journalism experience, and did they ever? On September 11th, Jane March was in his class. And before we knew it, he was saying, get the camera and go to the airport <laughs> um, to get the footage of the airplanes landing. And after that, like so many other students, she was back at the school volunteering, serving up food and organizing toiletries. For five days, when she wasn't here, she was working at the local grocery store. Um, it was very stressful for me. I was very quiet. A lot of them didn't speak English. They were passing me money. Um, and I remember going, oh my goodness, now I have to figure out how much to give them back. But a lot of growing up happened for Gander teens that week. Then I kind of stopped and thought about it. And I'm like, I'm worried about whether I'm giving them the right change. And they're worried about whether their families know they're alive. Who here has said, please? You all raise your hands. I think we've all done that. March has come full circle and is now a teacher in Gander, alongside her best friend, then and now. All right, Luke, can you tell me a way that you were kind, my sweet? Awesome. 
Together, they are passionate about teaching young children kindness and compassion. Like a lot of kids will know sort of that, you know, a bunch of planes landed here a long time ago before they were even uh, born. Um, they might know those details from their parents, but the thing that we, you know, kind of teach from when the first day they enter is kindness and how little acts of kindness, um, you know, lead up to be big things. Almost all of the former students I've been speaking with have mentioned this brown piece of paper. They didn't know it was still here, now mounted on the wall in the school, but it was put here in this exact spot during that week in September 2001. And the passengers filled almost every inch of it with heartfelt messages of thanks. I like this one. To the City of Angels, Gander. Happiness is hard to come by in this life, and you have given us more than our share. Or this one, if we could only ganderize the whole world, what a lovely little planet we would have. The world became so small really, really quick. And I think that's what sticks with me today. For Jennifer and Trent Skeynes, it was an intense cultural exchange. Trent's family had six stranded passengers from Mexico and Pakistan stay in their home. That experience, I think, really just exposed us to things that we wouldn't have seen. Now, on that day, I think it was more like, where, where am I going to volunteer? I wonder where Jen's going to volunteer. <laughs> they had met only days before. Again, with that kind of uh, emotional boiling pot, I suppose, it's, you know, that intensity, it's like a movie, right? It can bring you closer a lot faster than other circumstances. And it was just nice to see that he was willing to, you know, Keeps Helping is hot. <laughs> <laughs> now living in Mount Pearl, married with two kids, they insist they were just doing their part. None of this feels like a unique story, you know, for the two of us. People tend to think it is. Everyone went through this. Everyone had an experience and a story to tell. Yeah, what can I do for you today? Dr. Chris Downton sure has a story. He has a family practice in Vancouver, but focuses on global and refugee health. So I think that um, that drive to connect to people of different backgrounds, and uh, that's something that's still um, uh, that's still a strong desire of mine, and and I think um, can uh, can be brought back to some of those first exposures to diversity and international uh, events uh, that took place uh, in 2001. It also gives him hope. Is I think remembering that in uh, times of trauma and catastrophe, humans can come together and achieve something uh, despite differences. It, it gives me some hope that um, uh, you know that we can do the same to solve some other problems. Like many of us, he comes back to Gander regularly. Newfoundlanders are drawn to home. Perhaps it's the same sense of belonging that made some of those passengers here under the very worst of circumstances not want to leave, and in turn helped shape the lives of a generation of students. They really gave them so, of themselves. They could have taken that week off. You know, I mean, school was closed. This school system has produced some great people uh, in, that have gone on and made their, their mark in the world. The tragedy has not been forgotten, but 20 years on, there is still pride here, displayed all over town. And those young people? They're pretty grateful to have been raised here among people who showed them the meaning of community and connection. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Gander. That school has produced some great people, including Kayla. Tomorrow, CBC News Network will have more coverage of the 20th anniversary of 9-11, including a special from Gander's Airport, connecting through Gander airs at 6 and 8 p.m. Eastern. Well, it's emerged as a polarizing campaign issue, how to honor victims of residential schools. The idea that now it is a political um, talking point is quite disturbing. Up next, why some want politics put aside for a more permanent answer. And later, a Canadian connection to 9-11 often forgotten. The story from Yukon. Welcome back. With the federal election just a little over a week away now, advanced polls open today across the country, and some voters were in for a surprise, having to travel further away to cast their ballots at a polling station. Philip Lee Shannock explains why. 
It's an advanced polling station in an unconventional place, the Ontario Science Centre. I was surprised when I got my voter's card. I was like, wow, it's at the Science Centre? But yeah, it's, it's really convenient, it's really safe, everybody's far apart, so I really like it. Lots of space to distance and no lineups, but for this man, it was a bit of a hike. I live a little far from here, but I walk every morning. So I took my chance, I took my card with me, and I did it. Uh, I'm really happy I already cast my vote. Elections Canada says some schools, churches and colleges were not available due to pandemic restrictions. So in some areas, there are fewer places to cast your vote. It chose big venues to replace many small polling sites. So the biggest advantage to having fewer but larger sites is that they're safer. So it gives us the ability to offer the social distancing that we felt was necessary. The negative for some is that you might have to go a little bit further than you might have had in previous elections. Elections Canada has set up so-called super or mega polling stations like this before, when disruptive events like natural disasters have made it a challenge to cast a ballot close to home. In Manitoba, last election, a snowstorm and power outage forced a major evacuation. So a mega polling center was set up in the University of Winnipeg. Today, polls were held there at an art gallery, a racetrack, and Ikea. But by far, Toronto area ridings had the biggest consolidation of polling locations. In Toronto Centre, the number of polling stations dropped from 91 to just 15, an 84% drop. Spadina Fort York dropped 73%, Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill by 69%. This professor says Parliament missed an opportunity to change the Election Act and allow voting to stretch over three days. And that would have given them the flexibility to hold elections that were safe and secure for everybody and easy. For voters who aren't comfortable voting in person, mail-in ballots can be requested until Tuesday. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. A new issue has cropped up in this election race on a subject few expected to become divisive. Those flags flying at half-mast across Canada honoring the victims of residential schools. They've been lowered since May after the graves of hundreds of Indigenous children were detected. So what's the issue? Olivia Stefanovic explains. A symbol of a country in mourning, suddenly being politicized on the campaign trail. I'm very proud of our country, despite the scars from our past. The Conservative leader now says it's time to raise the flags. I have said that this September 30th, the National Day of Commemorating Truth and Reconciliation. We will do that as a country to recommit to reconciliation and we will then raise our flag as a sign of that commitment of building a strong and better Canada in the future. But the other major party leaders say they would take a different approach. I plan to keep those flags at half-mast uh, until uh, it is clear that Indigenous peoples are happy to raise them again. Well, I absolutely agree that there is a, a symbolic power in lowering the flags. What I really want to see is that every single one of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to actions are implemented. The idea that now it is a political um, talking point is quite disturbing. National Indigenous leaders are calling for the maple leaf to remain lowered at federal buildings until they reach an agreement with the government. That is an ultimate sign of respect that um, was never given during those children's lives. But some Indigenous people are concerned the longer the flags remain at half-mast, the less meaning the honour holds. If you stop noticing, that loses its value. This former Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner says instead the focus should be on building a national monument. That would be something that would be a living reminder um, and, and somewhere where people would be able to gather. No matter when the flags are raised, the next federal government will have to grapple with the enduring impacts of residential school and a painful legacy many Canadians are finally demanding be addressed. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. We all remember Gander's 9-11 story, but what about Whitehorse? They'd blocked off the highway, blocked off the airport, up next, the fear that gripped residents that day.
I'm Jamie Poisson. Join me for CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. Every weekday, Front Burner takes you deep into the story shaping Canada and the world. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. New York City and Washington, D.C. aren't the only places that were gripped by fear and panic 20 years ago tomorrow. Residents of one Canadian city also felt the terror and were bracing for the worst from the sky. Juanita Taylor has the little-known story from Canada's far north. It's as if it was like yesterday. I didn't want to leave anybody behind. We kind of lost our innocence. Memories of September 11th, two decades later, are difficult to forget in the Yukon capital. That's when the entire city was put on high alert because a Korean Air 737 carrying more than 200 people was believed to be hijacked and was heading there, escorted by fighter jets. The Mounted Police had taken command of the whole situation. They'd blocked off the highway, blocked off the airport. This former air traffic controller was working that day. And when I'm talking to the NORAD military fellow by the phone and he says the F-18s are en route, it really made an impact in terms of what could happen. The downtown was evacuated. Parents were told to pick up school children. This mom rushed to get her three kids. I just wanted to kind of collect everybody together. I think that's kind of the mother hen kind of thing, like, and, and try to figure out a way to get us all safely together. Her daughter was seven at the time. I know there was an announcement that we were having an evacuation and that it wasn't a drill. It was just like chaos and super confusing. Planes on the way in. Residents watched as the airliner landed safely. It hadn't been hijacked. Only later did the Prime Minister at the time reveal that he was prepared to take action. If you think they are terrorists, I think I said you call me again, but be ready to shoot them down. This local filmmaker still has many questions. Like why did the pilot activate the hijack signal? There should be a full and complete explanation of all the events that took place and rattled our community so fundamentally uh, 20 years ago. And he's not alone. Many Whitehorse residents still want to know exactly what happened on that terrifying day and why their city was put at risk. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Yellowknife. After the break, we meet a tennis legend from Nova Scotia. The effect that she's had on so many players, both in and outside of the tennis community, is incredible. Her passionate and charitable lifelong relationship with the sport is our moment. It's after this. Joe Ford turns 104 this December, but don't let that age deceive you. Although the Nova Scotian hung up a racket way back in 2018, she remains an active member of the tennis community and now spends her time raising scholarship funds for children under 10 to receive lessons from pro players. Her passion for the game and the people she's impacted on and off the court is our moment tonight. I think it's fantastic. Each year, a young person is given the opportunity to have professional lessons. She was the the very first person to pull a check out and donate it into the scholarship fund because she's so convinced of the value of the scholarship. The effect that she's had on so many players, both in and outside of the tennis community, is incredible. Well, I just loved it. I just went on playing as long as I could. I played till I was about 1998. I think it's very important for them to do the scholarship and then the, the kids can benefit from it. This event has really blossomed. It started small, it really started to grow, and it's, it means a lot. And even though she's no longer playing tennis, tennis is still in her blood. She loves it. She's just so special. She truly is special. That is an incredible story. It's an inspiring story. And so tennis, she says, has kept her young. And also there's a drink she makes every day that has vinegar, apple cider, honey and hot water so you know take that for what it's worth that's the national for september the 10th i hope you can join me on sunday for cross-country checkup on cbc radio that begins at 4 p.m eastern one pacific and later that evening back here on the national good night